the uh, information before we actually get into our presentation. I'm Bob Wolverton. I'm Program Director of the Northwest Regional Telehealth Resource Center. And uh, I'd like to invite you to join us again next month on February 26th when uh, Matt Levi from the Franciscan Healthcare Program will be joining us. Uh, Matt's got a couple of different things that uh, we've asked him to talk about, and we're not sure which one yet he will be presenting in February. But we'll let you know just as soon as possible. We'll blast out an email with uh, content on that. But be sure to join us, because uh, Matt's been doing some great things down there in Olympia, I believe it is. And we'd also like to invite you to save the date and join us in Seattle for our conference. Uh, that's March 30th through April 1st. We have a great uh, opportunity for telehealth program providers and, and participants and uh, employees and everybody else to uh, get together and do some networking. Let me just take a minute and go look through our uh, Adobe Connect room here and let you know what we have available for you. As you can see by my green arrow over here, we have a files module, and that module has uh, links to our conference flyer, so you can find out more detail about who's be presenting and then what we'll be up to in Seattle in March. And then today's slides will be available also as a PDF. You can just click on those links and download that. Down below that, we have web links to our uh, website, which has a wealth of information about the NRTRC and ideas on how it can help you, and a survey. Now, we really request that you join us by taking the survey and telling us what you thought of today's presentation and by telling us what you'd like to see in the future. We really want to plan these webinars to be useful to you. So uh, please let us know what you'd like to see. Then going to the left, we have a chat module. Please use this module. Enter your uh, questions about procedure, uh, technical issues. In there, monitor Martha and I will be monitoring that and try to do what we can to, um, to solve any challenges you might have. To the left of that, we have a question and answer module. And in that module, you can ask uh, questions for our presenter, Dr. Scott. He will uh, probably wait until the end of the presentation to respond to the questions. But as they come up, please ask them uh, in the module so that we can be sure that we get to, uh, get to an answer for you. And, uh, and then all the way on the left, the note module tells you pretty much the same thing I've told you, but uh, not as hesitatingly or, or uh, stumble bumming bummily. So now I'd like to introduce our speaker, finally. Um, today we have John Scott, who's got an uh, MD and Master of Science degree, and who is an Associate Professor of Medicine in the Division of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, and the first Medical Director of Telehealth at the University of Washington. John graduated from Stanford University with a degree in Human Biology, and attended the Georgetown University School of Medicine where he graduated with honors. He completed a residency in internal medicine at Stanford University Hospital, and then obtained subspecialty training in infectious diseases at the University of Washington. He has an active research program up at UW in viral hepatitis, and that's supported by federal foundation and pharmaceutical grants. And he's published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, as well as a great number of prestigious medical journals. In 2013, Dr. Scott spent four months at the University of Queensland Center for Online Health in Australia, learning about the Australian healthcare system and how telehealth can be used to increase specialty care access and to improve health outcomes. And he was awarded the best paper at the 2012 Global Health Conference in Sydney, Australia as well. In 2009, John launched the project ECHO, and ECHO stands for the Extension for Community Health Outcomes in Washington State. That's the first place that replicated the ECHO model outside of the originating sites in New Mexico. This innovative telehealth program helps clinicians serving in rural and underserved areas with the evaluation and treatment of hepatitis C initially, and has since expanded to the areas of HIV AIDS, chronic pain, addictions and psychiatry, a brand new program in multiple sclerosis and with complex care. So. I don't want to talk anymore. John, I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, thank you for joining us, and go ahead. Great. Thanks, Bob.
Um, thanks for that kind introduction and welcome everyone. I want to um, second the invitation to um, all you come to Seattle at the end of March and early April. That's a beautiful time of year here. Probably the cherry blossoms will be turning and um, I've uh, toured the hotel where we're going to be hosting the conference, uh, the Olive 8. It's a really nice hotel, uh, great location. So uh, I do encourage you all to attend. Um, we're going to be talking more in depth about Project Echo during that, that conference. And I know Matt Levi also is, is presenting. And the uh, last thing I wanted to say about that is my, my colleague from University of Queensland, Anthony Smith, is going to be one of the plenary speakers. And they, they have um, probably one of the largest telehealth programs in the world um, with uh, you know staff about 40 and you know several thousand consultations every month. So um, I, I hope that uh, you all can come to Seattle then. So what I want to um, basically give an overview in the next uh, 20, 25 minutes is, is what we're doing in the area of telehealth at the University of Washington. And so um, as some of you know, we, we do have some unique challenges and opportunities. Um, the University of Washington is a, is a unique medical school because we educate students from the uh, five northwestern states. So the so-called WAMI network, that's Washington, Wyoming, Alaska, Montana, and Idaho. And many of these students then go on to UW-affiliated um, residency programs. And uh, we want to make sure that they're being supported um, during the residency and then even once they get into practice. And so. Um, because our, our students are distributed, we've had to rely on uh, telehealth solutions for that. Uh, the other challenge is um, that we have a level one trauma center um, in Seattle. That's Harborview, where I'm, I'm currently located. Uh, but uh, again, you have a, a five state region that only has one level trauma center. So if um, you have bad trauma in Alaska or Montana, or these places are often getting on a plane or helicopter to come to us. and, and uh, we want to make sure that there's uh, good communication before, during, and even after their their uh, visit to Harborview. So um, we've been increasingly looking to telehealth to facilitate that communication. The next uh, challenge on there is Obamacare and, and just um, all the the new changes that that's brought with more patients being insured and uh, ACOs. So um, that we're we're looking to telehealth to fit into that equation. And lastly, um, as many of you know, uh, getting paid for, for doing telemedicine, that's a huge barrier. Um, and uh, we're one of the states that does not have any legislation that mandates that telehealth be paid for. Um, we had a bill here that came very close to being passed, and, and next week it's going to be reconsidered. So uh, please send your, your good vibes and well wishes to, to Olympia next week. Hopefully we can get it through next um, in this next session. So I just wanted to um, step back a minute and, and uh, let everyone know what our vision is for telehealth. And uh, this is, was developed by a, a committee several years ago. And that and the, so the vision is to to be a primary platform to project our expertise and to collaborate. I really want to em emphasize that word collaborate with our community and region for education, training. And, and providing expert clinical care in a, in a sustainable manner. So we want to have a, a robust telecommunication system that serves all the, the things we do, UW, that's um, uh, education, clinical care, research, and then also administrative um, programs. So uh, I want to go over the various types of telemedicine. I think a lot of you in this audience probably know um, how you can do it, but I just wanted to make sure we're all on the same page. So Probably the most common way of delivering telemedicine is the live face-to-face -face consultation, kind of using Skype or uh, um, you know various other services. And this has been used at the University of Washington in the area of telepsychiatry um, and other, um, you know, mostly uh, cognitive um, consultative specialties. The next area is store and forward, um, and we've been doing that for teledermatology. Um, and just launched a program in Teleburns and hoping to get something in for um, ophthalmology <clears throat> as well as radiology. Remote monitoring, where you have a, a device in a person's home or they're, uh, where they're living and um, they check their vitals themselves and then that gets beamed to the, um, 
the doctor or the clinic that's monitoring them. Um, so we had a pilot program this, this last summer for our high risk heart failure patients. Uh, we had 30 of them that uh, uh, had this device in their home for 90 days. And uh, we had no hospitalizations, which we were very happy for, with the one exception of a patient who choked on a hot dog. Um, so uh, we don't think that was probably a heart-related thing. And uh, we, we did ask if it was a low-salt hot dog, uh, by the way, and uh, they said it wasn't. So uh, anyways, we did, we um, were really pleased with those results and we're um, kind of an analyzing the, the business case for that. And then, and then the last way that we've been providing uh, telemedicine is through the case-based teleconferencing that Bob alluded to. We call it Project Echo. Um, and this is just a screenshot of what it, what it looks like. So basically, um, for the clinicians out there, it's kind of like morning report, um, but just doing it through a televideo conference. For the non-clinicians, I like to, to explain it through, as um, a, a Chinese proverb. Uh, if a hungry man comes to you and you want to eat him, have him to eat for a day, you give him a fish. If you want him to eat for a lifetime, you teach him how to fish. So what's going on is it's all uh, clinician to clinician. We're going over actual patients that are de-identified. And um, we give practical advice, but there's also this ongoing relationship. Um, we start each session off with 15-minute didactic that's uh, clinically relevant. Uh, and uh, in the middle of this, this screen here, you see a, um, one of our UW experts. But what you can't see is that he's flanked on, on the side by other experts in other specialties. So this, uh, many of the conditions we're dealing with really require multidisciplinary support. So um, when you present a case to an ECHO conference, you're getting uh, multiple opinions from multiple specialties. We make sure we're all on the same page. Um, so this has been a very efficient way of, of delivering healthcare. And just to walk you around um, who else is on this call, um, so in the upper left is Anchorage, um, and in the middle there is Boise. Um, we went down into Oregon um, to help out some ID docs down there. This is uh, the next one down is, um, I think, in Bozeman, another Oregon, a couple Oregon sites, uh, Spokane, and then I think this last person's down on the um, Olympic Peninsula. So huge area, uh, three different time zones, uh, over 2,500 mile reach there. Um, so we've been doing this since 2009 for hepatitis C uh, and then launched into to chronic pain and HIV. And um, it's, been, it's been a very rewarding and fun process. Um, I do want to let you know, um, just as a plug, that uh, we launched the multiple sclerosis uh, echo in the fall, and we're actively recruiting for, for neurologists, community neurologists who might, be, uh, might benefit from being able to consult with the MS Center at the University of Washington. So I uh, just wanted to talk about some of the current successes. Um, I mentioned we, we have a telepsychiatry program. We, we do that on a contract basis. Um, so we have a contract with one of our ACO partners, Peace Health, which is uh, in the Oregon, Washington, Alaska areas, it tends to be more in, in uh, rural hospitals or smaller areas, uh, smaller population areas. We've also worked with some of our local Indian tribes. And then um, we have an interesting program called the MHIT program. Basically what that is is a psychologist who um, is located in a federally qualified health center. And they have a phone call um, weekly with a psychiatrist back at the University of Washington. And they go through cases um, and to just make sure they have, are getting um, a good backup and that there's any kind of prescription that needs to be made, um, then they, they uh, loop in the primary care provider at that site. They've had over 20,000 consultations through the MHIT program. Teledermatology, we, we have an interesting pilot with the Community Health Plan of Washington. It's one of our Medicaid providers and the largest FQHC in our state, which is CMAR. Um, and just to give you a background on that, uh, most of the CMAR patients were trying to get into our dermatology clinic at Harborview, and it was an eight-month wait. Um, and some of them were, uh, these complaints were, things that could be managed with just a little bit of uh, assistance from a dermatologist. So we um, have an agreement between the three of us where uh, Dr. Roy Colvin is, is seeing uh, pictures of the lesions and has a little brief write-up of what's going on. And he um, gives a, a diagnosis and has a little bit of a write-up uh, in his note on 
some some educational principles of what would be the next steps to, to do. So this has been a very popular. We have a seminar set up with the Department of Corrections and Gerontology as well. Uh, so we launched a Tala Burns Clinic. Um, I mentioned that Harborview is a level one trauma center, uh, and that includes burns for, for kids and adults. Um, and what, what we've observed is that patients were being airlifted here, but then uh, once they went back to their community, they would have to get back in a car to, to uh, drive to Seattle for their follow-up, and that was very inconvenient. So we have uh, both a store and forward and an in, in-person teleburns clinic, and they can access um, the plastic surgeon, the um, psychologist, and the uh, occupational therapist um, during that uh, live face-to-face -face visit. It's been very popular. So Telepain um, is a program that was started by Artie Dornbus, one of the faculty in the School of Nursing, and David Talvin, who's a pain medicine specialist, and um, uses the ECHO principles. They've been funded through the NIH and actually just got a Centers of Excellence Award. Um, they've really been trying to incorporate medical students in that process. It's been so successful that they um, offer it twice a week on Wednesdays uh, and Thursdays at the noontime hour. Um, and I think they're always looking for um, new sites. So if you uh, know of sites that might benefit from this, uh, I can make the proper connections. I mentioned Project ECHO um, <clears throat> and MS being our, our next launch, but um, we also have something for uh, liver care. Uh, so those were people with end-stage liver disease. Lastly, we have a telestroke program uh, with 10 different hospitals here in Washington State, including with one of our ACO partners in Peace Health. I'm going to increase my mic. I see that some people are having a hard time hearing me, so I'm going to click that. Uh, Linda, can you hear me any better now? Uh, I'll, I'll try to speak. I'll get a little bit closer and try to uh, speak a little bit more loudly. So um, one, one area that uh, has kind of come up in this last uh, year or so is using mobile apps, so apps on your smartphones, to deliver health care. And uh, there's been quite a bit of innovation by our faculty members. So one example is a, an app uh, developed by Dr. Jim Stout in pediatrics called BillyCam. And this is a, an, uh, an app where you take a picture of a neonate um, who uh, has a suspicion for uh, neonatal jaundice, and you have a little strip, a color metric strip that you put on the, the baby's um, skin, and you just take a picture, and then, and then the app will uh, adjust the, the color of the skin to that little um, standard uh, strip, and uh, they can pretty accurately diagnose what the, the baby's um, blood bilirubin level is. So this is um, you know something that might be uh, applicable in more rural areas of the United States, but particularly uh, a, a real boon for uh, developing countries. And so that's how it's being um, developed at the current uh, point in time. And uh, Jim just got a life science discovery fund to, to develop that further. Uh, and there's another faculty member who's got uh, an app called Gut Guru, which is basically an app to keep track of a person's diet and symptoms. These are for patients who have irritable bowel syndrome. And just one other example is Phone Astra, which is an app to help um, pregnant women who um, are nursing and maybe they can't um, uh, nurse their baby right away, and so they want to sterilize it for um, use at another time. So there's just a small sampling of what's going on um, uh, elsewhere in the University of Washington. Uh, so uh, we've, we've also partnered with some um, technology companies most notably with a company called Cellscope Odo, uh, which is a, is a little screenshot in the upper left here. This is a device, it's basically an otoscope that snaps on the back of an iPhone 5 and 6, and then the app um, allows um, uh, either the doctor or uh, uh, the patient or a uh, patient's parent to take a picture of the, um, the ear, um, the outer ear there, um, to diagnose acute problems like otitis media. And so then they can just uh, take a picture or a film and uh, send it then to the doctor, and, and the doctor can see really what's going on. Uh, so this is now commercially available. I think it's around $200 you can buy it. Um, but we helped to kind of beta test it, and we have an ongoing uh, collaboration with our Department of uh, Ear, Nose, and Throat and, and this company. 
And there's some other companies like um, uh, Alive Core where you can have a one lead EKG, uh, which is pretty much your chest. We're not working with them, but just to give you an idea of what's going on in the uh, in the uh, app uh, front of uh, and um, um, you know how to how to incorporate our smartphones with this. So as some of you have heard, um, there. There's even more innovation coming our way with the, the Apple Watch, which will be keeping track of blood pressure, pulse. Um, they will also keep track of movement. Um, and it's a platform where um, developers can um, create health applications. So um, that's going to be, a, I think, a, a new area of, of innovation in the next year or so. so I just want to give you an idea of um, where we are currently working. At the University of Washington, a lot of our efforts are focused in the state of Washington through Project ECHO. Seattle Children's has eight um, ancillary sites um, around the Whammy region <clears throat> where uh, telemedicine is delivered mostly in telepsychiatry and telecardiology. Uh, and then we also have some telestroke partners um, also in Washington state. So um, that's um, kind of the summary of the good things, but I wanted to talk about some of the, the tougher or, or more challenging things in telemedicine. And I think probably the, the biggest thing has just been the poor reimbursement structure as, uh, as currently um, uh, detailed by CMS. And, and the, I just want to review what those three requirements are. The first is that in order to get reimbursed, the patient has to be seen through a live face-to-face -face video conference, uh, which is not too hard, uh, but the next two tend to be more um, Difficult. The second is they need to be in a certified rural location that's determined by HRSA. Um, and so in our state of Washington, I think only about 20 to 25 percent of all zip codes are considered rural. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean they're in a um, close to a facility, but they're not, not rural. So a good example would be Yakima is, is uh, not considered rural, and we have quite a number of, of patients who are coming to Seattle to get care. It would be much more convenient if they could uh, access us through telemedicine. The third requirement is in, that the patient needs to be in a healthcare facility. They can't cannot be at home. Um, so these regulations date back, I think, around 2001, and there's some move afoot um, to to peel back some of these restrictions. The next challenge uh, in telemedicine that we've encountered is that you do have a marginal decrease in efficiency, and that's because it's hard to overbook, and there's a little bit more uh, coordination on both ends. Um, uh, we occasionally have technical issues, not, not too often, but it's really those first two issues that seem to be uh, rate limiting. Uh, as I've gone around and talked to my colleagues, I think there's still a perception amongst the providers that it's inferior to in-person, and it's going to add to their workload. Uh, and I always say that there are certainly some conditions where this is not as good as being in-person in and, and that you really need to lay hands on a person. Um, but uh, I do like to present um, studies that have been done have shown equal efficacy and um, you know work on a pilot basis on some of these um, other areas. So I've uh, um, one of the things that I do when I um, uh, talk to a new department that's interested in doing telemedicine is we talk a lot about workflow and how do we fit this into uh, a, a usual visit <clears throat> and in, importantly how do we get into our electronic health record. Uh, so we're, we're on EPIC here at the University of Washington, at least as an outpatient clinic, and we have a, a, a Cerner-based inpatient. So a little bit of a challenge. We have two different EHRs, um, but there is a uh, telemedicine module for EPIC, um, and uh, some of you may actually be, be using that, um, but we currently don't have that. So I do want to talk about the opportunities in telemedicine. And, I alluded to it earlier about ACA and the rise of the ACO. I think as as we um, become increasingly responsible for the cost of healthcare, we're going to look at some of these low value visits and, and turn to telemedicine as a way to to to, um, to deliver that care and also to coordinate um, the transitions from hospitalization to outpatient and make sure that everyone's um, basically using the same standards or practices. Uh, we see a uh, greater consolidation of healthcare systems. Um, we're currently four hospitals at UW Medicine, um, so Harborview, the main university hospital northwest and valley. Um, but we also have ACO partners, and so we think that telemedicine is a way to 
communicate better and, and spread um, some of these more complicated patients around the system. One of the big, big demands here is that patients are learning about it and, and once they've done it once or twice, they, they uh, really want to keep doing it. Um, we've, we found the technology is getting a lot cheaper. So just a couple years ago, we had a very expensive server. Uh, and now we use a cloud-based solution that's probably one-tenth, one-one-hundredth the cost of that server alone. So uh, we really um, enjoyed using that, that uh, cloud-based solution. We've also seen a lot more people using uh, mobile phones, smartphones, uh, and I think they're going to be using that as a portal to, to interact with their healthcare system. Uh, the other major trend in American medicine is the rise of chronic disease and, and uh, an aging population. Uh, there's the 550 Club, um, where, which is basically alluding to 5% of patients account for 50% of all healthcare spending. And if there's a way that we can identify those patients um, and get them plugged into coordinated care, uh, then that's definitely going to um, help drive down the overall cost of the healthcare system. See a lot of those people have overlapping physical and mental health issues. So the fact that if we can bring a psychiatrist into more and more of our visits, I think we'll we'll really be able to um, uh, provide better care for them. Um, so uh, my colleagues around the country are, are using telemedicine to to target those those patients. Um, and I don't have any preliminary data, but I just let you know that uh, telemedicine is increasingly looked looked to as a solution for for that uh, that problem. So um, I wanted to uh, just uh, mention one brief study that was in the area of remote monitoring. And you may, may have seen this a couple years ago. Uh, it was a, a British study called the Whole System Demonstrator Study. And um, the, the intervention was they put a home monitoring device um, that can track blood sugar, uh, pulse oximetry, blood pressure, weight, and um, heart rate. And uh, half the patients got the, the intervention, half got usual care. Uh, and after one year of this, mortality was re reduced by half, and hospitalizations or emergency departments were reduced by 20%, with even, even those who got admitted to stay was one day on average shorter. So um, saved lives, prevented hospitalizations, and even once they got hospitalized, they stayed longer. So uh, this is um, a, a huge example of how Telemedicine can make a huge impact on the system. Um, this was in from the British Medical Journal in 2012. So uh, that's kind of a broad level um, view of what we're doing at UW Medicine, and I wanted to open it up now for questions and comments. Thanks. I guess Thanks, John. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry to have stepped on you there. Uh, if you have questions for John, please enter them in the question and answer pod down below. And I just wanted to say that I sat in a, on a Project ECHO uh, meeting back at UW when I was visiting there about a year or so ago, and it's really an exciting program. How's it going? How's ECHO growing uh, with you, John? Uh, it's, it, it's really taking off. Um, so we just got a large CDC grant um, for the area of hepatitis C, and so we're Interestingly, we're, we're actually targeting King County with this new grant because we're finding that um, a lot of FQHCs and primary care doctors want to to get into the area of treating hepatitis C with these all oral medications. So that's um, it's not all all rural. I mean, I think a lot of times we think with telemedicine that this is a rural thing, but uh, we're targeting the urban area of King County. Um, and uh, we've been approached by the CDC on a variety of other projects. Um, we're expanding um, Project Echo internationally, so Sub-Saharan Africa and HIV. So it's it's growing quite a bit, and I think um, ACOs is really that's a really the, the niche where Project Echo in particular can fit. Okay, we have a couple of questions in the Q and A pod. Can you see them? Okay, John. Yeah, I see one from Elizabeth, and she said, "What would you attribute as key factors to Project Echo success?" Um, a great question. Uh, I think the first one where I'd say is that a lot of docs get it because it's part of their training system. I, I, um, I mentioned this is kind of like morning report. So when I explain it to people, they like they get it pretty quickly. Um, I think the second part of 
Project Echo's success is that um, we, we fit it into the, the very busy day of the average clinician. We do it over the lunch hour. Um, and if people are running late or um, have patient constraints, then we do really try to fit it in for their, uh, for their workflow. Um, they get CME. It's another big draw. Um, I think they like the camaraderie. So one thing um, that I've learned from my colleagues on ECHO is, is uh, how isolating it can be practicing in a rural community where you don't always have someone to run a case by. So they, they really like that, this um, weekly forum where they can uh, kind of just you know run a case by an expert. Uh, and they help each other out. So it's, it's not a one-way exchange of information. Um, in fact, some of the, the best advice, the most helpful advice is coming from other rural doctors who really know what it's like to practice in, in the settings. So those have kind of been the, you know, I think the things that set it apart from maybe some other telemedicine projects. There's a couple of um, questions in the Q&A pot too, John. Um, I don't know if you can see them or not. Okay, uh, I'm going to start with Bruce, and let me scroll down here. If you if you click on that, it'll expand it to the full question. Uh, with a shortage of specialists in rural. Uh, actually, um, Bob, I'm only getting that first line of Bruce's um, message. Would you mind reading it for me, Bob? Uh, yeah, sure. I'll be glad to. Um, he asks, um, with the shortage of specialists, then how many of the Washington critical access hospitals are using telemedicine? And then he gives an example of uh, Mason General, which has a CMS grant for telepsychiatry. No, Bruce, I, I don't know the exact number. Um, my guess would probably be over 50% use some kind of telehealth intervention. Um, and, and the reason I don't know that number is because I know that they work with other hospitals, with Swedish, Providence, with Multicare, or Franciscan. But my, my sense is that uh, many of the critical access hospitals have at least one, one program where they're doing telehealth. I, w I would hope it's going to be 100% soon. Um, so, Bob, why don't you read the next question for me? Yeah, then we've got a question from Larry who's asking, uh, in the British example you cited on uh, remote monitoring, uh, do you know what kind of telehealth was used? Uh, yeah, so it was a, uh, let me go back to my slide that, so that you guys can get a visual here. So, um, see this picture of this woman who has, she's putting on the blood pressure cuff? Um, that's kind of the visual of what they're doing. I don't, I can't remember if it, what manufacturer it was, whether it was, you know, a Qualcomm or a Philips system, but it's a, it's basically about the size of a, um, of an iPad, uh, and the way it works is um, the instructions that on the screen, um, that they'll walk them through how to put the blood pressure cuff on and, and make sure it's nice and snug, and then once that reading's done. Um, Larry, it goes through a 3G or 4G network. Um, it, it gets beamed into a, a, a dashboard um, on the clinic's uh, computer, and they preset what is an out-of-range reading and what's an in-range. So they can very quickly look at their whole panel, um, you know, around 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning, and see all the red, see who is. Um, out of range, and they pick up the phone. They call them and say, "Oh, we noticed you gained, you know, t two kilos overnight. What happened?" Um, and then they can, you know, make the changes in their medications um, much more quickly before the patients show up in, in real extreme situations. So that's the. Did I answer your question? Um, that was Larry. Larry. Yeah, and and uh, for people who are interested in that. Uh, a couple of months ago, NRTRC had a, uh, a webinar on remote monitoring uh, done in uh, North Carolina and in Oregon. And if you have questions about that, feel free to contact me and I'll get you linked into the uh, presentation. 
so you can find out more about remote monitoring if that's an interest for you. Are there any more questions for John? We've got one person typing. Uh, thanks, um, Christiane. Uh, is there information available about, how, about the cost benefit Project ECHO initiatives? How are case based teleconferencing services typically funded? Um, so, Christiane, um, uh, I know that there was a cost benefit analysis done of the Hep C ECHO. Um, it was done by Dr. John Wong um, at Tufts. And it is massively cost effective. So around six or seven thousand dollars per quality. Just to give you a reference point, anything below forty thousand dollars per quality is considered to be cost effective. So this is definitely cost effective, at least in the area of hepatitis C. I, I don't know if that has been published yet, but it was presented at an, an international liver meeting uh, in 2013. Um, so the other question is, how are they typically funded? So we got started, uh, and Dr. Rora got started through funding from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Um, and they, RWJ continues to be a big supporter. Um, we, we, our funding ran out about two years ago. And since then, the Department of Health has funded us. Um, so it's, a, uh, it's a state uh, budget issue. And also in New Mexico, there's been a line item in the state budget for about 10 years that has funded um, Project Echo in New Mexico. And I, and I really think that that's the best way to do it, because we, we view Project Echo as, as public health. Um, so we um, have been successful in lobbying it through uh, public health mechanisms. Otherwise, you're looking at grants, and grants tend to run out um, and don't get renewed. I, I think it's sustainability has been the biggest challenge. We have a Joyce. Yeah, Joyce has a question, Bob. Yeah. Uh, she's wondering if you see genetics as having a role in ECHO either now or in the future. So, like genetic counseling, um, is that what you're thinking, Joyce? Um, and if that's the case, I don't know if there are any um, ECHOs focused specifically. On, on genetic counseling, like um, you know, pregnant women. Um, so, you know, I, I think it can be used for a lot of different diseases. We we typically try to go for common, complex, chronic diseases. Um, so the the best applications have been for like um, diabetes, um, obesity, um, chronic lung disease like COPD, asthma. Um, you know, those things that that the average um, provider sees pretty frequently. Um, there's, there's enough hepatitis C that um, you know most primary care doctors are encountering that. So that's one of the criteria for for Project Echo is, is a common complex chronic disease. All right, Bob. How are we doing? Any other questions out there? I don't see any in the in the pod. I don't see anybody typing right now, but. We'll encourage them if you have some fun last minute questions to um, to put them up. Uh, Martha has jumped in with the survey we'd like you to take. Tell us how many uh, people attended, what you thought of today's presentation, what you'd like to see in the future. That's really important to us. Uh, but if you have questions, I think John has a few more minutes before he has to go to his next conference call. If you'd like to toss a quick question out to us, otherwise, uh, we'll say thank you, John. That was informative. And um, I'll be in touch with you very shortly. I've got a question for you. So. Uh, Great. And I, I just left my contact info up there. Um, you can email me, call me. Uh, we have a, a, a web page that describes a little bit more what we're doing at UW. Um, but thank you, everyone, for your attention. And um, I hope to see you in person in Seattle. Well, I'll be there with John to greet you all. So come and join us.